Well, hello there, and welcome to another segment of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I am obviously quite festive today. Greg gave me, I think it was three options on hats today. This is part of the deal. You know, I agree to do the hat. Laugh at myself today. I am Chiquita Banana. Now you have to, I think, what did you give me, Greg? You gave me the chef, the flying pig, or Chiquita. So I am Chiquita. Although I cannot, I'm going to date myself. I think it's Carmen Miranda who actually did this. And obviously I cannot sing or dance like Carmen Miranda. But here we go. So I'm going to lose the headgear because it is incredibly hot in this hangar. I am going to toss this exciting fruit salad off camera there. Greg did a great job. Greg, of course, today is my solipsistic assistant, my solipsistic assistant. Again, I am going to lose a tooth probably pronouncing all of these. Now today, you know, last segment we were talking about uh, Grumman fighters and early jet fighters, and we are still in the late World War II-ish and then into the Korean War time band. And what we're doing today is we are talking about an aircraft called the F-7F, the Tiger Cat. Now the Tiger Cat is really the end of the line um, as far as the, with the Bear Cat, we are going to do the Bear Cat. People are saying, no, do the Bear Cat. We are going to do the Bear Cat. We are going to do the Hell Cat. Those are coming. But uh, this is a concept that actually goes pre-war. And Greg can get a little bit of a shot. This airplane is actually huge. It is enormous. Um, it is a concept that actually started pre-war in the late 30s. And that was that we hadn't got to the point. Remember, we talked about the apex predators the piston engine, late World War II piston engine fighters, fast, maneuverable, a lot of range. The pre-war, there was still an idea that you could take a twin engine, what's called a heavy fighter, and have a heavy fighter fly all the way into the target. Now, the thinking behind that was relatively simple. And the, the thinking was that the airplane would be fast, you could have a tail gunner, somebody protecting the tail. You had an advantage of twin engines. You had two engines, so you had an a, a added safety advantage, right? And they had to be fast. Now, you could see that pre-war concept all the way into bombers. Greg, you know, you look at the, the B-17 with all those guns and everything, the, hence the term flying fortress. The idea was not that the B-17 went in on, let's say, combined arms with fighter escort. The idea was the B-17 fought off the fighters all the way into the target and fought its way back out. Well, you know, the best of intentions are tempered by combat. And what ended up happening very early in the war is designers realized that these big, heavy, uh, twin engine airplanes were really no match for the, the second generation of World War II fighters. They were highly maneuverable uh, and they, they packed a big punch. And these airplanes, although some of them were very fast, and when I'm talking about different concepts in, in this type of a design, you can go and look at the ME 110, the ME 410, the ME 210, the Smiths. The, the Germans called the ME-110 the destroyer, and the idea was that airplane was going to fight its way all in the target. It, it was a target. It was a, a big, heavy twin-engine fighter. It had a two-man crew. Reality, as I said, in combat, it got into combat with the British and got shot to pieces. Now, with a lot of these airplanes, what ended up happening, and it's, we're going to get into specific history on this aircraft, um, they found a different life like the, the 110 series and on, those, those Messerschmitt twin, twin engine fighters really moved on into night fighters as radar technology became uh, more advanced and could, you could get uh, a, um, 
a radar into a small package into a fighter and, and power it and everything. So they did find life, and even with this airplane they found life, as a, as a secondary use, but they were never really used for their intended design. So enter Grauman, and what Grauman did was Grauman was working on a design again, early war and in, uh, pre-war and then early war called the XP-50. The XP-50 was a twin engine aircraft. It was again at what was called a heavy fighter. There was only one of them made and it was lost in I believe Greg uh, supercharger exploded and the airplane was lost. But it evolved into this aircraft. Now this aircraft had its first flight in 1943. It went into operational service in late 1944. The F-7F, known as the Tiger Cat, a new twin-engine fighter bomber. Powered by double WASP engines, the F-7F qualifies at its critical altitude for the 425 mile an hour class. The plane carries 4,000 pounds of bombs or a full-sized marine torpedo or rockets. For extra range, it has a 300-gallon drop tank in addition to its regular gas supply. First production of the F-7F goes to the Marine Corps, which will use them to clean up enemy strong points ahead of advancing ground troops. Later, the Navy will get them. It had a big challenge. There were about 364, 365 of these built. They were built in various dashes, which I'm going to talk about. But, Greg, there was a problem. And that was, this thing was so big, it had a couple of issues. One, very high landing speeds. We've talked about, and we're going to talk a bit about a little, uh, someplace I want the younger viewers to go and learn something. But it had extremely high landing speeds for carriers, which is not good, which is why a lot of the Navy fighters have that big, fat wing and very good low-speed handle, handling characteristics because they're being recovered by those carriers. This airplane had very high landing speed. It was big, which meant in the design phase, Greg, it could only be operated off the Midway-class carriers. Now, the Midway-class carriers were laid down late in the war and came in a little bit later. They were very big and Midway class carriers, Greg, served, the Midway served all the way up into the early 90s. So they had a lot of life. But you got to remember at the time, the Navy was built around another type of character, carrier, character, a carrier, Greg, I'm going to enunciate today. The carrier was the Essex class carrier. The Essex class carrier was built around we call them weapon systems now, but it was built around like the TBM and the Hellcat. It was not built around these larger aircraft. So when this airplane went and did carrier qualifications, due to the issues that I just told you, it could not get carrier qualified. Can you believe that? Early versions of this could not get carrier qualified. And they had a lot of issues with the wings. This particular version of this airplane is an F7F-3. There were 189 of these built. The carrier qualification for this aircraft, they had a wing failure, and it couldn't get qualified. It was only a very late version of this airplane, of which, and this is really interesting, Greg, if you believe this, there are only 12 of them made you could get carrier qualified. So what ended up happening was the Marines, these were operating, being operated by the Marines and off land-based uh, land air bases. And the idea was they, were, they modified into a night fighter with the APS-6 radar. Now this aircraft was all the way into, flew all the way into, it was retired in 1954. It flew in Korea. It did have some combat victories, Greg, but it was shot down biplanes. So I can't say that it was up against, uh, it wasn't a big interceptor. It was too late for uh, World War II, and when it was used in Korea, it was used uh, as a night fighter with that airborne radar. Now in the carrier qual quals, it did, it had a wing failure, and uh, that spooked people a little bit. 
It also, now this is, the aircraft's built around a very reliable, the R2800 engine, very reliable engine that was a workhorse engine in World War II. It was, to give you an idea, when it came into service, it was very fast. It, it was about 70 miles an hour faster. Top speeds in the 460, 470 range, but it was about 70 miles, fast, 70 miles an hour faster than the Hellcat, if you can believe that. Single engine handling characteristics, if you lost an engine on this, were also not good, which is another thing that they did not really care for. Now, the one thing about this, Greg, is I, for you at home, I'm going to tell you something, all the kids at home. This is a fun fact. I want you to go out and look at it. I want you to look for the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, or for Aeronautics. Now, the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, they, in the 20s and 30s, got to remember, in aviation, and Greg, it is, we are in the middle of a huge heat wave here. I can see Greg sweating. I'm sweating. Uh, it is very hot. But uh, anything in aviation, if it goes all the way up to SpaceX, okay, everything in aviation, we stand on the shoulders of giants. All of this technology, is a, it builds. There's a term called a technology tree. We build technology, and so, and we build on the building blocks of things that have gone before us. Every once in a while, there's a game changer, and whether it might be in propulsion, propulsion, it might be in airfoils, but everything starts all the way back to, and we talked about it before, the Wright brothers uh, and wing warping or wing bending with those airplanes and how they learned how to use these airfoils. This aircraft, for you younger folks, I want you to go out and look up NACA. And I, this it actually has a NACA airfoil rating. Now, why is that important? Well, NACA went through, they had about 40 wind tunnels at Langley, and they did all kinds of tests on airfoils. And what they came up with were codes that would give you an indication for each airfoil. In other words, you could get to the mathematic equation of why the airfoil worked. Now, I want you to go out and look that up. You don't have to know every airfoil, but you do have to understand if you're interested, for the younger folks out there, if you're interested in this, you have to understand where all, all of it starts. And it's good to understand the basics so that when you move forward in, all the way up to rockets, you can understand how people got to the way they were going to get as far as how these airplanes flew. Now, the thing about this particular aircraft is it was also it was heavily armed. It could have four 20 millimeter cannons. In fact, you can actually see they're closed up on this one. Four 20 millimeter cannons and four 50 caliber machine guns, which made it ideal for that night fighter role or ground attack. In night fighter role, it didn't have it did have a second crew member. It was also used for some gunnery training. Uh, but it is the end of the line. Now it is, we talked about with the, with the Panther, it is a transitional aircraft from the piston engines to jets. And it was retired in the mid-50s, and that gives you a good idea. Really low production numbers, but there was just nowhere, nowhere to go with this. It was, we were done with this, and we were transitioning to jets. The various services were committed to transferring, trans, um, transitioning to jets, and they were, uh, they were going to do whatever it took to get there. That's why we went through so many generations of jet fighters in the early 50s as these designs kept changing. Now, you say, well, Fred, the twin engine design, there has to be some success. Greg is like, there has to be some success, and there actually was. And which, what, what aircraft was it, Greg? It was the P-38. Probably if you go through history, and you affectionados, correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section, but I would argue that in this particular design concept of twin engine heavy fighter, that probably, and I, I, as I talked about, the German designs are interesting, but they really weren't successful in daylight very much. And, but the P-38 really found, as a twin engine heavy fighter, found its own uh, in the Pacific and worked really well in the Pacific. But to my point, when you put it into the European theater at high, higher altitudes, it, had, it, it, was at, it was equal to or it had a little bit of trouble with German fighters up to the point where the Luftwaffe was being degraded and they, they could no longer field trained pilots and very many aircraft due to resource issues. 
There goes one of those jets. I don't know if you can pick that up or not, Greg. We might have lost the audio. But I think the P38 could arguably be the best of this design concept as far as implementation and use in combat. Now, the P38, Greg, believe it or not, Lockheed actually went out and experimented with a pressurized version of this. Greg, you might want to look it up. They actually went out and even tried to improve the P38 further, and what they realized was that they could not improve the design any further. They went back to the base design of the P38 and just kept making newer versions of that, but they kind of dropped the whole idea of taking the design any further. So what I want to do today is I am going to go over here to my stage two, and I'm going to look at the one. This is an this is an interesting bottle, Greg. This is an interesting choice today. A twist cap, so I will test my my grip strength here. This is Fentiman's botanically brewed. What does botanically brewed mean? Is it brewed by plants? I do not know. It is a ginger beer, a traditional botanical ginger beverage with herbal extracts. You know, Greg, I've always wanted herbal extracts, so we'll see how badly it is. Oh, they are very proud of their product. It is exquisitely crafted, exquisitely crafted since uh, 1905. Now, Fentimens is not a sponsor of the program. Um, there is a sell-by date, October 20, so we're within the band range of, uh, you don't have to call poison control, 110 calories. So let me test my grip strength here, Greg. Oh, first shot, I was able to get it. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to salute. I talked about NACA. I want to salute all those early engineers that came up with all the airplane designs that we're talking about without those folks. And remember, slide rules, trial and error. If one inch was good, two inches was better, but you went out and tried to break the airplane, those folks really had the right stuff. So all of those aviation pioneers, I salute you. Oh, <laughs> um, maybe, you know, somebody who had like a taste for this might enjoy it. This has, uh, with ginger, it has that very kind of, I don't know, hot finish. Um, uh, uh, it's cold, Greg. That's about all I can say. I'll take one more swig, as I always do, just to see whether or not if my taste buds weren't uh, damaged in the process, but we'll see. Greg, I can always, you can always tell when I put something down. Uh, we had one last week that was actually pretty good. This one has a little bit too hot a finish for me, but if you like ginger, you might do that. Now, I am going to do my traditional removal of the model, and we'll talk about, we talked about, again, that big wing. Uh, two, you could have two places. Armament was in the front. R2800 twin engines. Problem with the big wing, as I talked about, was very high speed landing characteristics on aircraft carriers. The air, airframe was also really large and did not lend itself to the primary weapon system that the United States Navy was using at that time, which was the SX class carriers. The post war car carriers it was, were big enough to handle this airplane, but remember, why were we going to those larger carriers? Ultimately, with like Nimitz and now Ford class, is because those jets kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But you can see this, as I talked about, a, a wing failure, but the airplane did evolve into a night fighter. Now, Greg, the interesting thing about this is this airplane actually had a life past this. You know what that was? It was a fire bomber. There's actually, it carried a big old pod underneath it, and I actually believe that this airplane was a fire bomber before it was reworked. Um, it, was, it carried a big pod, and it was a fire bomber. They keep getting bigger and bigger now, Greg. I think we have a 747 or a DC-10 fire bomber now. But back in the day, these were, were the early fire bombers. They were using B-17s, so it did have a life. It was also, also used, and it is used, in air racing. It's found itself 
its way into affectionado hands. It's uh, uh, heavily used in air racing. It is in a number of collections. There, are, for the low production numbers, there's actually uh, a number of these flying, which is which is interesting, and um, the, a lot of them are flying in affectionado hands. This particular aircraft, we operate in a ground run status. It is available. It is ground. It is able to be ground run, but we do not fly it at this time. Greg, one of the things that hit struck me the other day: we have 70 aircraft in the collection, if you can believe that. 70 airframes. I don't know how we got that many, but uh, with we've got an exciting airplane coming in, the F-117. Uh, that will put us over the top as far as 70 airplanes. So you can come in and see a whole bunch of aircraft like this and the jets that follow on behind it. But this particular, um, this particular aircraft was a design concept that was pre-war and then just didn't really have anywhere to go after that. But it has lived on. Now the one thing that I, when we're talking about wing design, and I, I don't know if you can get this, but with these Navy fighters and with the Grumman last week, you can see the way that the wing tapers the fuselage. And when we're talking about NACA, uh, these, and, and by the way, this does have a NACA rating, so when you go out and look at it, the Navy aircraft, you'll see the designers did everything they could do to get as much wing area as possible because of that low speed handling. I didn't talk about it last week, but with the um, with the Panther, you can really see the how the wing tapers back to the fuselage, and they're using. Remember, the kids at home. Not only does the wing give you lift, but all this other stuff gives you a little bit of lift, even the fuselage. And if you look at the Panther and how these wings taper, you get you get quite a bit of lift out of it. Now, Greg, I have a Fred fun fact. A Fred fun fact. This is the Tiger Cat, but do you know that it started a, a very familiar working name originally? The original name for this airplane, the working name, was the Tomcat. The Tomcat was the original working name. The folks in Grumman at the time felt that the name was too gender specific, and they didn't use it. Can you believe that? It wouldn't come back until many years later, 20, 25 years later, after the airplane retired in the F-14 Tomcat, which is now a legendary airplane. But in the day, there's your friend fun fact. This actually started out as the Tomcat. Now I'm going to put this down, and I'm going to go over here if I don't drop everything. We'll see if I can set it down. There we go. Now, what do we have on the table? We are paying homage to the cat. You need one of these. This alone will scare burglars away. It will drive your pets insane. And I understand that he actually can fly an airplane, Greg. I, I am told that this, this little guy actually is. But you need to go out to the, the website and pick, your up, pick up this beautiful little plushie. It actually has the Palm Springs Air Museum logo on it. It has correct aviation goggles and the uh, imitation faux fur is it, it is soft to the touch and it will you can clutch this as you're dreaming of airplanes as I'm wiping off the sweat you can you can clutch this as you are dreaming of airplanes and it will make you feel all that better about aviation so this is the sum up on the F7F the Tiger Cat Again, really, really cool airplane in the Navy inventory. I want to thank you for visiting us today. Remember, go out to that uh, YouTube and smash that subscribe button. You know, I say smash that subscribe button. I want how, wonder how many people at home have like broken iPads. Hulk, smash, smash subscribe button. But you need to <clears throat> smash that subscribe button. Like us on Facebook. Remember, we cannot restore these airplanes without your donations. Go out to the webpage and uh, give us a donation. There's a donation tab where you can always use that. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.